Here we're looking at a rotating rigid body. So this ellipse here, if you like, it's just a potato. And we've stabbed through it with a pencil right here at the origin. And this is really key that the place we're rotating it from totally changes what's about to happen. So you got to have that origin identified clearly. And what I'm trying to do here is say, given a rotation rate omega, what's the total kinetic energy in this rigid body? And so the technique is to break it up into many, many little point masses and then find the kinetic energy of each one of those. So my total kinetic energy, I'll call it K net. Well, that's going to be the sum of all the contributions from each of these point masses. And then I can just use the kinetic energy formula to write down what that kinetic energy is for each one of them. But now I'm going to take advantage of the fact that every one of these little point masses has the same angular velocity. I'm going to replace V with R omega. And the Ri's, that, that is the distance to the, to the rotation axis, those are different for each of the point masses, but they all have the same angular velocity. And I'll go ahead and square that. And while I'm at it, I'm going to move a one half out in front. So I get mi ri squared omega squared. So every term in the sum has the same exact omega squared in it. That allows me to factor it out. And I end up with 1 half times the sum of mi ri squared multiplied by omega squared. This thing in the parentheses gets a special name. It's called the moment of inertia for this rigid body. And we use a capital I for that. And this allows us to rewrite the net kinetic energy of this rigid body in pure rotation as 1 half I omega squared. And that's a familiar kind of expression. If I compare that to kinetic energy in translational motion, I see that for rotational dynamics, the moment of inertia I plays the role of mass. And this is going to be true beyond just this kinetic energy formula. We're going to see it over and over again that I plays the role of mass as we build the rotational analog to our translational dynamics. Let's apply this to a simple example. So here I have two one kilogram masses. They're attached by a light rod, meaning I'm just going to neglect any energy carried by the rod itself. It has a length of one meter. And I want the moment of inertia, and again, this is key, that it changes depending on what rotation axis you, you choose. So I have to say with respect to what rotation axis, and in this case I said the center of mass. So we're going to spin it around the center of mass, which is clearly just in the middle of the rod. And I want to find the moment of inertia and the total kinetic energy. So I need the distance to the rotation axis for each of these, and that's 50 centimeters or 0 0.5 meters. My moment of inertia is the sum of all the masses times their distance to the rotation axis squared. And that's going to be one kilogram at half a meter squared plus another one kilogram at half a meter squared. And this gives me a grand total of 0 0.5 kilogram meters squared. Then I can plug into the kinetic energy formula. K is 1 half times I omega squared. And I get 1 half times 0.5 kilogram meters squared times omega squared. That was just given as 10 radians per second. So remembering that radians are actually unitless, I can just disappear that. And the number I get out of this is 2.5 kilogram meters squared per second squared. And what do those units mean? Well, there's units of mass times the units of speed squared. So I know it has to come out as energy. Another way to argue it is to say it's kilogram meters per second squared, which is a Newton multiplied by one meter, which would give me Newton meters. Either way you look at it, it's two and a half joules.